Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the latest in the series of resource calling webinars. Great to have you with us today. My name is Phil Cole. I'm the head of membership at Wind Europe and also part of the resource team. For those unfamiliar with resource, we were established in 2017 as the European Alliance of Corporate Buyers and Suppliers of Renewable Energy. The operation and maintenance of solar and wind farms are, of course, an integral part of the supply of renewable energy to corporate buyers. And so I'm delighted to moderate today's webinar on the subject. Before we start, I'd just like to highlight some housekeeping rules. So this webinar is being recorded and will, will be published on the resource website afterwards. So please feel free, uh, please feel free to share it with any colleagues uh, or other interested partners. But it's a webinar with a twist. You'll hear me calling our speakers one-on-one -on -one to catch up on a range of topics before we then all come together for a question and answer session towards the end. So please do submit questions as we go along via the question box and they'll get to me to put to our speakers. It's really your opportunity to put questions to today's business leaders and speakers. So I'll quickly remind everyone one final element that some of our speakers are working from home or, or home offices. So please bear with us if you see any screen pauses and things like that and we'll come back together. So today I'll be having calls with Frederick Roche, who's the CEO of Callista Energy, Mohamed Malik, founder at Newer Energy, and Hendrik Bouchen, general manager at Deutsche Wind Technique. So first I'll call Frederick, and then I'll call Mohamed, and finally Hendrik. Right, on to today's topic at hand. Renewable energy operators and service providers have had to automate and digitalize their processes at speeds never seen before due to the impact of the global pandemic. So the questions that I'll be putting to you as the attendees, but also to the speakers, will focus on the following areas. How has the coronavirus crisis changed the operation and maintenance of renewable energy plants? What does the current situation mean for the work environment in the renewable sector? How will we be operating and maintaining wind and solar farms in five years, 10 years compared to now? And finally, how can we help energy buyers of all sizes to utilize renewable energy as part of their energy mix and energy procurement strategy? And what changes need to happen for all of this to take place? So you'll now get to hear me call our first speaker. And let's call Frederick now. Frederick is the CEO at Callisto Energy and has been with the company for 12 years. Callisto Energy is an independent electricity producer and has been operating since 2005 and now has 20 wind farms in operation. They invest in competitive and decentralized renewable energy, offering a compromise between available local resources, efficiency and environmental impact. Let's see if Frederick's available. Hey, good morning. Hi, Frederick. How are you? I'm very well. Good to see you, Phil. Yeah, it's fantastic to see you and good to, good to speak to you again. How have things been and where are you in the world right now? Uh, I'm actually in the office uh, <coughs> in Paris. Uh, we are expecting fewer uh, additional restrictions to the way we um, uh, run our lives later today. But uh, so far, we're still allowed to go in, in the office, which is a, a lot easier. <laughs> Yeah, this is true. This is true. Well, being based in Brussels myself, indeed, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're in the same situation as you, I think. Uh, we do an update tomorrow, so I think we'll probably be in the same place. But the good thing is, I think we're all used now to this virtual way of working, right? So it's uh, uh, it's sort of par for the course now, par for the course. Now, Frederick, I want to catch up on a conversation we had a few weeks ago and, and maybe put some questions to you. I hope you've got some time now. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Fantastic, fantastic. So maybe if you could just remind me, it'd be great to sort of understand the journey that Callisto Energy has been on over the past few years in terms of your development. But a, a large uh, fraction of uh, what we've been up to is, is actually public. Um, we are, I would identify two main areas. One is we've undertaken a vast project of repowering turbines. Um, most of our wind farms uh, were uh, put up in the early uh, 2000. Uh, and the uh, turbine aging, so we we are re-permitting uh, most of our sites to putting new turbines there, which you would expect is keeping us very busy. 
because it, it amounts to a uh, re-permitting of everything. We also have launched an initiative of combining wind turbines with um, uh, car chargers, fast car chargers, uh, with the concept of uh, putting your turbine where the chargers are needed and not asking yourself whether you can add chargers to your turbine. So it's a different focus and uh, we mm -hmm. are looking to having 80 sites uh, wow. and uh, this is also uh, keeping us very, very busy, plus the normal operations, of course. Of course, of course, which, which I think actually takes us on to a really, you know, interesting topic that I'm really, you know, asking a lot of people at the moment. I'm really keen to understand sort of what you've learned talking of the current situation as an energy producer since the start of the coronavirus pandemic and how that may be impacting some of these plans that you've just highlighted for the future. Well, uh, surprisingly, <clears throat> you'd be surprised. The, the first lessons learned for us is the extreme resilience and strengths uh, of our operation and business. Uh, in terms of producing electricity with existing turbines, uh, COVID has had no impact. Uh, mm -hmm. We were uh, operating, uh, France had a lot more wind than uh, in the past few years, and uh, uh, we also have contract backups, meaning that uh, there were incidents, like we had blade issues on one site, uh, but this was uh, covered by insurance, uh, and so we probably lost two or three months uh, in terms of putting the turbines back up again uh, with proper blades, but um, it would have been a messy situation anyway, and, and COVID just made it a little slower, but uh, in the end, financially, it's going to be uh, completely neutral to us, uh, mm -hmm. thanks to the insurance and contractual setup that we have for the operation of our assets. Okay, so it sounds like, broadly speaking, maybe better than people were expecting, but actually, in you know, quite positive then, really. In terms of operation, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And that has a lot to say with uh, <clears throat> the way the entire industry is organized. Uh, I think there's... Uh, a lot of remote controls, there's a lot of uh, remote analysis, uh, and the only crunch, I guess, COVID is, is, is generating is when it comes to the supply of parts in context where uh -huh. you can't move people and goods as easily as you would normally do. Uh, and we were lucky enough because the uh, confinement period uh, didn't last for more than two or three months that we didn't have that many incidents. Um, yeah. uh, but but uh, scheduled maintenance, um, was going on as appropriate. There were, of course, measures taken by the OEM providers to make sure that uh, contamination was uh, uh, prevented, but, but that, that didn't stop any of the uh, normal activities uh, on, on the OEM. Yeah, okay, so, so great. So, I mean, it sounds like essentially you haven't really too much had to adapt your way of working then. But, you know, in, in, in terms of operation, no. Yeah. In terms of yeah. development, it's the reverse story because there mm. uh, you by law have to consult and, and, and sell your project to people. Uh, you have a lot of uh, public consultation and all that came to an end. Also, the uh, French administration decided that they would really confine for good and uh, for some of them stop working for three to four months. Uh, mm. And uh, so the uh, development work has actually uh, experienced a big uh, a big slowdown uh, which is continuing okay so that that is interesting actually it nicely ties into something that i did want to ask you i mean from our previous conversation i mean as you know the european commission you know is estimating that we need around 750 gigawatts of onshore wind uh, by 2050 versus the 174 gigawatts that we have now currently installed um so it sounds like you know in the short term it slowed things down but I mean as we look to the future I mean what changes do you think we need to see in order for this goal to be achieved obviously it's a, it's a significant growth from where we currently are well there's many legs to your question <laughs> I guess <laughs> l l l looking at France in particular what is critically needed is more resources in at the administration level to mm. instruct and deal with applications um, there is a general feel that there's too many public servants, there's uh, more and more calls to reduce public spending. But uh, if you do that, uh, the, given the complexity of permitting, uh, if we don't get more human resources uh, on the ground, the ability of the French government to de deliver more permits is, is a complete bottleneck. And uh, 
you will see next year uh, tenders uh, for uh, permits that have been obtained. Uh, my guess is that they won't be anywhere near uh, the total uh, global of megawatts uh, up to tender because of that permitting issue. The, mm -hmm. The, the other thing is, and this is right in line with our strategy, if you look at existing sites and repower them, if you, you can, by changing the turbines uh, on a site that's already accepted and, and welcomed by people, multiply production by four or five. So rather than yes. being negative about repowering, it's a great way uh, to improve uh, profitability through a, a lot more production and update the uh, uh, wind farms to uh, current uh, production standards which are a lot uh, more efficient. Um, in a nutshell, I mean if, if it were only that, uh, that would have, there's, there's a number of other French specifics now we, we are on a uh, uh, European audience so I, I, I don't know if it's appropriate for me to go into the uh, French details, but there are also here a lot of restrictions to uh, putting in turbines. Uh, a great part of our territory is is blocked by the army, by radars, by lots of constraints, and I think uh, it it would be very beneficial to rethink about these constraints and try and find compromise and limit them so that permitting is easier. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thanks for that. And. I mean, just just touching on that aspect, then. I mean, what what areas do you think really need to be addressed? You know, when it comes to working, for example, with the military, because I know across Europe that is an issue. I mean, you mentioned it being France, but it is, of course, an issue across Europe. Um, so the more general permitting journey, what do you think sort of needs to be changed there from that that side of things? Well, they they, they need to uh, they need to accept that they have to evolve in an area where there are turbines. I mean, like yeah. if if you go on an operating front. You find this, the uh, the uh, scene the way it is, and if there are turbines, there are turbines. If there are trees, there are trees. So uh, I think it, it probably takes uh, more investment so that their equipment is is better equipped to deal with obstacles such as wind turbines. Uh, but yeah. at a time where we are spending an enormous amount of public money uh, to support the industry, I think uh, the long term the saving you would make with bigger rotors uh, and more wind turbines would actually reduce the amount of subsidies necessary to an extent that is yeah. higher than the cost of putting more investment into military equipment so that they can cope with it. Yeah, so so it sounds sort of a bit counterintuitive, doesn't it? In the short term, they're trying to save funds, but in the long term, they're missing out on the, on the opportunity of longer cost savings. Yeah, uh, but the sound of it, yeah. We, we, we all run by short term, and I don't blame them for that. We, we actually yeah, do. Of but in terms of deploying public subsidies, maybe this is where uh, the long term could uh, be factored in uh, as a great opportunity. I mean, touching on what 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 opportunities are there with the public money available uh, through the COVID situation and the uh, European recovery plan, you could also think about uh, a more global subvention to uh, give a bonus to manufacturing done, being done in Europe. Uh, like having a, a, a premium uh, points on the tender, for example, and you could probably think of a European funding of the extra cost so that it doesn't fall onto the uh, consumers uh, for developing and, 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 and putting a plus to whatever is manufactured in Europe. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really interesting aspect in regard to global versus European-based supply chains. Um, and that I think nicely takes us on to something else I wanted to touch on was sort of how you expect the operation and maintenance of renewable sites to evolve over the next few years and maybe also touching on that supply side. Um, what, what's your view on that? I think it's, it's, it's performing pretty well today. Uh, in the next few years what I see emerging is independent maintenance. A lot of the OEM is today done by turbine manufacturers. Uh, and there's a good reason for it. They have a better access to spare parts. They, they, they can probably, with the volume they have, uh, get better prices. They also have all the feedback with all the turbines running all over the world. Uh, and so that they uh, definitely are technical advantage. They also have 
uh, the, the number of, 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 of uh, scope of knowledge you need to uh, have a turbine run is, is quite large, so you need big volumes to really be efficient. But I would expect independence maintenance uh, will uh, pick up and, and probably also uh, multi-branding maintenance from turbine manufacturers where today Vestas does Vestas, Nordex does Nordex, uh, mm. But you, 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 you can see them moving to doing the OEM for their competitors' turbines, and I think that will probably increase. The, the other thing is, of course, the uh, additional tools being available for predictive maintenance, uh, uh, artificial intelligence for one, uh, and, and this has been a continuous progress uh, on, on, on prediction and making the, uh, the, the maintenance a lot more cheaper and a lot more efficient. Yeah, I think I think that's that's some really good points. And I mean, you mentioned there the sort of size of uh, sorry, the, the opportunity for, for big volumes and, and how things move through. What I would like to also touch on a little bit is is big data. Now, big data by some is seen as the future of you know finding efficiencies as we get to bigger turbines and uh, and areas such as that. And it is also seen by some as as important in the whole power purchase agreement discussion. To make sure that the right information is being shared between an off taker and a supplier but i'm quite interested to focus a little bit actually on the big data when it comes to the operation of wind farms and i'm sort of on the fence with this but is it is it is big data and the use and process in the big data right for all operations or do you feel it's more specific to certain areas more relevant to certain areas well, I think the number of parameters you have to look at for wind turbines is not, uh, that doesn't need, I mean, too much information is probably not going to help. Uh, and if you're looking at having big data information available, uh, you want to be careful that dealing with this is not increasing your cost base uh, and that you're only getting information that is important. So uh, I think we, we're not doing too bad at the moment. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how offshore uh, does it because their constraint on getting access to turbine is is bigger and there are communication between onshore and uh, offshore uh, in terms yes. of OEM and turbines. But but I'm, I'm, I don't think there's any magic there. Uh, I think getting data is good. Using it the right way is, 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 is the difficulty and the amount of investment you would have to put in uh, to make sure that you organize the data you get in an efficient way is a bit of a question mark for me. Uh, I mean, to take a, a, a parallel, you, you, it's public knowledge that the uh, secret services across the world are collecting tons of image and information from all over, from satellites, and their issue, they can't deal with it. They, they, they just can't. I mean, it, it, it gets lost. Now, there's no suggestion that you should do the same with turbines, but uh, yeah. uh, the, the, there's a bit of an issue, too, uh, to, uh, to know what you do with it and, and what good does it do, uh, short of, uh, of, of, of being fanatic about getting more information. Um, yeah, it, 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 I think that's a really, that's a, it, it's a really uh, interesting comparison, actually, when you mentioned that, you know, as we move more to, to the use of big data in the wider field, the reality is at the moment, the process in power just isn't there to be able to make sense of it all. I think, I think that's a really, you know, nice sort of angle when you look at uh, wind farms and the growing, the, the, and essentially the growth of volumes as, as we go forward, because of course, more process in power would be needed. Um, so I've only got a, sort of an, another minute or so now, but I, what I would really like to hear um is sort of what the future looks like for Callista Energy because I know that you mentioned your your exploring some other opportunities it'd be great to hear that side as well well I think the future looks uh, good uh, in as much as we are at the right spot I mean we're doing the right thing we need more renewable energy in Europe in France in particular uh, we're actually expanding in, in the rest of Europe. We have a wind farm under construction in Holland, uh, sorry, in Zealand, so it's the Netherlands. Uh, we also uh, are expanding into Germany. Um, and uh, uh, I think the, the future looks bright. We should not be too optimistic though, because we are still uh, operating in a hostile environment. Uh, that's that's for France, where uh, on the political scene, the wind energy, onshore wind, is is uh, is um, in a very irrational way uh, being heavily criticised, and uh, you get under attack regularly. But uh, 
uh, at least so far, there is political consensus on moving on and 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 developing the uh, the renewable the, the onshore wind, but it's it's uh, a fight of every day to make sure that uh, um, we don't get distracted and can move forward. But uh, in a few words, <laughs> the future looks really great, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. Well, exactly. I mean, and what a great way to finish the call. I mean, you know, we're, we're looking forward to seeing how everything develops. It sounds like a really interesting time for you and the team there. So looking forward to speaking in a few weeks and, and seeing how everything's going. Thank uh, you. See so, you. Yeah, that yeah, was wonderful. Really, really great, Frederick. So thanks. Thanks for the time. I uh, appreciate you taking some time out of your day and look forward to speaking soon. My, my pleasure. Thank you. Bye bye, Phil. Great. So it was great to speak to Frederick there to understand what's happening uh, with Callisto Energy and some of the uh, some of the various insights that came in, which I think are really relevant and and uh, go right across the, the renewables industry. So now you'll get to hear me speak to Mohammed Malik of New Energy. Mohammed is the founder of New Energy, which was set up around 18 months ago. And New Energy aims to seamlessly connect renewable buyers with local sustainable energy innovation, with the ultimate goal of making renewable energy procurement simple and accessible for all. So let's give Mohammed a call now. Hi Mohammed. Hi Phil, how are you? Very well, how are you? Doing well, doing well despite uh, 2020. Of course, what a year, what a year for us all. Yeah, we've all had to find uh, ways of adapting both professionally and personally, but uh, you know, I think we all we all have a challenge in this industry, right? So uh, if anything, that's the one thing I can say that we're, we seem to be quite uh, able to adapt. Yeah, and wh wh where, are, where are you now? Uh, London-based, um, it's interesting and eerie to see central London fairly vacant, but uh, here we are. Yeah, yeah, no, great. Well, so I, I've, just, I've actually just speaking to uh, to Frederick. You might know Frederick from Callisto Energy, and he was mentioning what's happening uh, there in Paris. And I think we can, you know, we can all uh, relate to uh, various cities around the world and towns that are, are going through a similar thing. So, yeah, yeah. So thanks for the time. I hope, I hope we've got a, a few minutes. I wanted to sort of uh, to pick up on some conversations uh, that we had a couple of weeks ago. Are you are you free now? Yes, please. Look forward to it. Fantastic. So I'm just wondering if you could sort of remind me about the journey that New Energy has been on uh, since it was founded about 18 months ago. So we founded uh, New Energy to bring about positive change. Uh, we're focused on sustainability, as you know, um, mm. and our technology solutions and platform, uh, as you mentioned, it's it, 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 at its foremost, it looks to simplify and streamline the journey in not only defining, but also tracking your progress in terms of achieving sustainable goals. And for us, uh, it's whether you're a large multinational corporation, a uh, very complex national company with a large footprint, or your small company or a small community seeking to uh, maintain or achieve sustainable credentials, then we're your go-to partner in that sense. Um, our current undertakings are very much scope two centric. Uh, and our ambitions are to extend that with comprehensive coverage for scope one through three. Okay, fantastic. Uh, yeah, great, great to, to be reminded of that. Um, what I would like to focus on are some topics, particularly around PPAs, power purchase agreements. Um, and maybe to start with, it'd be great to sort of get your view on how you've seen the PPA markets uh, and the power markets more generally uh, respond since the start of the pandemic a few months ago. So the journey, um, as you mentioned, and the experience to date with PPAs has been somewhat uh, parallel to what experiences we've had in other uh, large-scale, complex, and multi-year transformational programs, where you're seen as a bit of an outsider stepping into an entrenched ways of working and ways of thinking, uh, and you're seen and met with a degree of usual skepticism and resistance mm -hmm. to change. Um, but especially with the uh, onset of the pandemic uh, and the change in the ways of working, it's been brought about uh, um, a degree of positive change in the sense that uh, people are realizing that the old ways of working do are no longer applicable. 
So there's a need for a digital experience. There's a need for digital process and tools uh, from both perspectives, obviously from the off-taker and uh, the purchaser perspective, demand side, and the generator supply side as well, uh, where generators are now, we're being approached uh, and uh, uh, contacted by generators from different parts of the world who are seeking to embed their uh, supply side um, uh, digital platforms and their own tools within uh, newer energy so that it streamlines the process across the board. Great. Okay. That's, I think that's, that's really interesting to hear. Um, and actually, I've just been speaking, as I mentioned, to Frederick at, uh, at Callisto Energy about how they've been managing the past few months. I mean, talking about the areas you've just highlighted, looking at the off-taker side, the energy buyer side, can you let me know how we can use technology as an enabler to boost the uptake of renewable PPAs from your from your side. So, from our perspective, um, one aspect of um, technology and PPAs um, that would be good to, um, I guess, uh, highlight and discuss is that uh, PPA has become a good banner heading of a set of activities that are related to um, either direct uh, goal setting and goals target uh, matching, or uh, and it's from an off-taker point of view and perspective, it could be that your product or your solution is one of many. So from an off-taker point of view, it's more of a portfolio approach. So whether that's a, a group of uh, sites uh, that are spread across the world or whether it's a specific large-scale consumer site that you need multitudes of products, including wind, solar, and other smart flexibility solutions like uh, storage or balancing services to meet and mitigate your uh, economic and financial and sustainable uh, targets. So in that sense, uh, uh, our technology adoption approach is a, uh, as simplified as it is, it's seeking to show what is being planned. Why, the, what, why are you taking the steps that you're seeking to take? What's the cost benefit assessment of by scenario? in relation to a given footprint, who's responsible and accountable for what, including especially elements uh, such as we've discussed uh, of risk and risk sharing and risk uh, transparency. Uh, and transparency at large, whether that's internal or external, uh, that's uh, what, what uh, we've been focused on and we're seeking to uh, maintain that across uh, from large off-takers to smaller scale uh, uh, clients and subscribers. Yeah, great, great to hear that. And I think sort of tied in with that, you know, data and essentially data transparency is seen by many as key to unlocking the opportunities afforded to, to us through renewable energy production. In your view, what do developers and suppliers uh, need to bring in that regard? And at what point should both sides of the table be sharing data to make sure that they are achieving the best results through a PPA or, or other metrics? That's, I, I think it's a core question, and uh, we've heard all the common sayings that data is the new oil and uh, data is more valuable than um, other industries combined. But realistically, uh, for us, and that's where we um, uh, are very uh, proud of the fact that uh, we've had uh, a myriad of experiences across different sectors um, focused on being able to rationalize data and content strategies. So an example of that for us would be is that we're working on ontology solutions that for in, the, in the case of the EU, EU is pushing a EU taxonomy for a common understanding, especially from an investment and investment portfolio per perspective. Whereas we're working on ontologies that tie up SDGs with ESG perspectives so that you have a more top-down harmonized view of what exactly is it that you're seeking to uh, to measure and what's the hierarchy and what's the framework based on which you're seeking to measure these elements and where then associate that with data and data sets rather than starting out with data and data sets which as uh, uh, you know the panelists have highlighted that comes with an extreme cost it not only is it expensive but it also actually data and technology has a carbon footprint. So we have to be very careful and very conscious of the fact that we're not uh, just producing data and storing it and uh, adding to the problem. So from our point of view and perspective, because we're coming at it top down, 
we're looking at it from an ontology point of view so that we can cross-reference domains. So SDGs uh, push out 17 dimensions uh, in terms of measurements, and they need to be cross-referenced, and especially when we're trying to integrate them across with ESG metrics, then how do we correlate all of this and manage all the data that's related to that? Um, for us, we use uh, uh, tools like knowledge maps, knowledge graphs, and data graphs that allow us to be able to very clearly identify which data is the most frequently used data, irrespective of the source of data, uh, irrespective of uh, cost of data, so that you don't aren't overpaying for data either. Because uh, as we earlier mentioned, there is a significant cost to uh, collecting and uh, being able to access these data sets. So for us, uh, we uh, are very happy for the learnings we've had in our uh, past experiences that we're able to get our arms around this uh, fairly reasonably and quickly. Yeah, that's great. And I think, you know, obviously, again, data, you know, continues to be a discussion point. And as you said, data is seen by some as the, as the new oil, and, and, and I wouldn't disagree with that necessarily. But of course, data is one of the key areas that we can, you know, help to identify and then manage risks. So I'm interested to get from your side, your view on how we can utilize things like uh, risk management solutions uh, as part of the process and at what point they should be employed when you're looking at PPAs and the more general power procurement process. So for us, uh, some of the key uh, learnings and findings that, as you had earlier mentioned, includes um, the, the constant uh, communication with um, generators and uh, supply side uh, actors. And we're, what we've learned there is that the offline, the traditional uh, and existing or old way of working uh, included a high degree of um, uh, a, a challenge response and a action and reaction between the off-taker uh, representatives and the supplier representatives, where there was a lot of offline activity around elements such as risk management, such as being able to ratify and or conclude the right uh, demand profile, and then how do you, do you allocate risk in relation to that based on your profile as a uh, off-taker. So what we're doing there is that not only are we eliminating a lot of that uh, back and forth cyclical loops between uh, various actors and parties by exposing uh, specific metrics and data around credit worthiness in today's world, let alone from uh, nine or 10 months ago, uh, in, uh -huh. in your current live credit worthiness in relation to the purchase, and then how we can disintermediate in terms of being able to offer up risk management solutions that are cost effective and they don't necessarily uh, break the bank in terms of being able to switch from uh, gray towards green or renewable energy. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's an area of, of just increasing importance and it's really important, you know, as I think you highlighted there for both sides as well, you know, the buy side and the supply side to understand the risks and, and to really identify and manage them properly to make sure that the right products and services are essentially being uh, contracted. Um, and that's that's one of the many areas that we that we like to focus on, like resources, as, as you know. Um, maybe just one last question then for now. Uh, I'm really interested to hear because every time we speak, you always tell me about the exciting projects that are going on, and I would love to to know from your side what New Energy is working on uh, over the next few months, uh, and and what the industry can look forward to finding out. Uh, for us, the, just the evolution of uh, Scope Two Energy and the uh, comprehensive coverage between all scopes is going to be a massive undertaking uh, and we're going to have, have a myriad of experiences around the globe in terms of being able to, to create digital solutions to create transparency around uh, uh, and eliminate elements such as greenwashing um, but in in addition to that we're also working on solutions and partnerships including digital twin solutions for smart districts, whether that's residential or industrial, and smart cities, uh, which uh, where digital twins have gone beyond the hype cycle and starting to deliver real meaningful results, uh, not only in terms of the traditional operations and maintenance where they can reduce uh, up to 25% of the cost of uh, operations and maintenance, which is you know, uh, 
the development cycles are short, but the operations and maintenance cycles are multi-year and multi-decade in some instances. So significant cost reduction there is very interesting. But to correlate that with um, the previous discussion and previous call you had, uh, digital twins could be uh, instrumental even during the permitting and planning process. Because wow. what digital twins allow you to do is that once you've created a, uh, a layer between existing environment, the, your visualization of your proposed built environment, then you're able to then start running simulations around that. And by virtue of being able to do artificial intelligence and other tools-based simulation, you're able to offer up uh, and to short circuit that entire permitting process by being able to, at, if not at a minimum day one, entirely uh, eradicate any of the bottlenecks, but you can take a, make a significant dent in being able to streamline that process. So yeah. that's just a small example of how you're taking technology and tools and incorporating that uh, within this specific context to deliver results. That's great. Thank you, Mohammed. I definitely want to speak to you more about digital twins. I think this is a really, really interesting area. We're going to come back on that uh, maybe in a, in a call not too too far in the future. So thank you for your time um, and uh, speak to you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Mohammed. Bye now. So great to hear from Mohammed about the opportunities afforded through making sure you're employing the right risk management solutions, using data in the right way, and how interesting and innovative ideas like digital twins can really help you to understand your overall strategy. And I think we'll, we'll come back on that maybe a bit later on uh, in this call. So on to my final call now, um, and now I'm going to call Hendrik. So Hendrik is the general manager at Deutsche Wind Technique and has been with the organization for almost three years, but has been involved in the wind industry for much longer, and certainly longer than me. Deutsche Wind Technique is a specialist in the maintenance and repair of wind turbines and substations on land and at sea. So I'm looking forward now to seeing if we can get Hendrik on the line. Hi, Phil. Hi, Hendrik. Do you How are you? a new telephone? <laughs> yeah, sorry, different number. I apologize. I've, I, I've dropped okay. it one too many times. <laughs> How are you? Sounds a little bit old fashioned, the line, but anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. You know, I'm, I'm an old fashioned guy. What can I say? I'm British. You know, it's one of those things. How are you? How's things? <laughs> Fine, I'm well. Thanks, thanks. And you? Yeah, really well, thank you. Really well. How, uh, where in the world are you at the moment? Oh, I'm I'm just in Bremen, and I try to fix the turbine. So that's our usual <laughs> job. I do it as well as the office, and um, that's what we're usually doing. I'm in the north of Germany. Yeah. So it's so it's work and fun, then it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good to hear. Good to hear. Well, that's that's great actually. So I've I've just been having some calls today. So I've spoken to Paris, London, and now Bremen. So we're doing a, a, a great tour of, uh, of of Europe there. Um, but it's great to uh, it's great to speak to you. I'm just wondering if you've got a minute or two uh, for some questions. We're going to follow up on some of our previous conversations. Of course, fine, fine, fine. Fantastic, fantastic. So, Hendrik, I'm really interested to hear how the past few months have been for you and the team at Deutsche Wind Technique, and I'm particularly interested to hear uh, what has surprised you, either positively or negatively, since the start of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure as well. For us, the last months were challenging, but uh, uh, I have to say more the positive aspects or more the positive uh, things uh, uh, came up or are more there. So positive is definitely that we could run our business, let's say, uh, in a normal way. Yeah. So uh, our first thought was that we have to bring our technicians to the wind farms. So that was uh, everywhere almost possible. And then as well, it was a question then after one month of the of the lockdown phase in springtime, do we get the spare parts? So are these parts available for us? That was as well uh, absolutely the case. So thanks for all the suppliers. And uh, last but not least was uh, that our administrative guys or, or ladies were could not work in the office, but then like now with uh, with all these new technologies, <laughs> Here we are. Let's say are in place. Uh, uh, finally, we could work as well from home, which we planned for longer terms, 
But yeah. I would say the companies as well as were never brave enough to do it. Now mm -hmm. we say for Corona phase, we could uh, we could do it. So let's say altogether it was uh, uh, not too bad for us. The only things which were quite made us a headache are the regulations. So the regulations to uh, uh, to send service staff abroad. So that makes us currently as well a, a headache. If you see the situation now, each country almost each hour you get a new regulation which country is a hotspot, which is not. Sure. Yeah. Can I'm allowed to send people to UK, to France, specialists or offshore as well? I'm I'm still allowed to to send people there. That's that's uh, that makes it not easy. Yeah. 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 It's it, it's certainly an interesting time. I think the one thing I have seen is that the industry. Uh, just seems to be very adaptable you know i think you know after maybe a couple of weeks of trepidation as you say just trying to make sense of the regulations um from what i'm hearing from speaking to other organizations everyone seems uh you know almost business as usual but maybe business with a, a few slight changes but most things still taking place but you touched on the the personal side there the people side and that i think is a really interesting um area for maybe just to sort of explore a little bit so the movement of people has certainly been a pain point during the past few months um but particularly I, from what i hear in terms of accessing offshore wind farms and offshore substations so can you tell me a little bit how you managed to overcome those challenges mm -hmm. so yeah so especially in, in offshore in the beginning it was uh, almost as well they are really a, a lockdown as well for so service mm -hmm. stuff because uh, uh, as you can so the offshore wind farms has got anyhow a very high restriction regarding HSE. Yeah? So anyhow, we are dealing here with very high demands. And you can imagine if something like this comes up, as well our HSE coordinators, but as well the coordinators from the customers, seems to be as well a little bit overstrained in the beginning with the situation. So they, they said, okay, very strict. Okay, you cannot uh, bring in more than three guys in one vessel. Uh, so, and we said, hey, usually we are bringing uh, 10 to 15 guys are in one yeah. vessel to entering the wind farm, and then it's just allowed to to bring over three or five. I said, okay, that's uh, that's from a commercial point, it makes no sense. Uh, we need more teams or more people there. So, to find a concept, for instance, just for this case, to bring our guys, and most of the of the times you are working with different teams on one uh, wind turbine in, in one phase. yeah. So you send mm -hmm. over not just our stuff. So for instance, you send over as well inspectors or something to the turbines and then to mix these teams. So we can say in the first two, three months, almost we couldn't enter the parks. So uh, because due to, to this uh, uh, hiccup with, uh, with this thing then, uh, ideas came up to to cover the seats completely with plexiglass. Yeah, so <laughs> it looks a little bit funny then in these vessels. Yeah, so you we were sitting alone there and everything was covered by plexiglass. So and then step by step, the HSE coordinators found out possibilities to to bring over the the service stuff. But uh, for offshore especially, you can imagine the offshore maintenance phase is starting in springtime and the main phase for maintenance you have for then in summer. In winter the, yeah. the weather conditions are not good enough and let's say around about the half of the season was gone until we could let's say come back to a normal phase. That means we have got uh, all in the, in the uh, all uh, uh, wind farms have got a slightly uh, a backlog in the maintenance and here we have to find now ways uh, and ideas to to bring this back yeah that was the situation yeah i yeah, know yeah really interested to sort of uh to sort of hear that and i think sort of maybe tied in with that in in, in, a, in a in a strange way is as we see offshore wind continuing to grow and mm -hmm. also to other renewables solar onshore wind and, and and wide renewables you know we're starting to see new people entering the workplace uh, but also mm -hmm. experienced workers moving from other industries such as oil and gas to renewables. Yeah. What trainings are necessary in this situation to make sure that you know people are able to transfer seamlessly? And is mm -hmm. there a need for sort of more standardized trainings and certification across different countries? Or is the current way the right way? 
So what, what we are doing is with uh, carrier changer or people who are changing from one, uh, from one uh, area to, to the wind uh, businesses that we have got our own training center facilities in, in North mm -hmm. Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, so usually without COVID, we are sending uh, guys from France, from UK, from Netherlands who want to join us or so as well as the wind industry to those uh, training facilities where we can train them HSD requirements, but as well technically, we have got as well nacelles and so from wind turbines in this training center and we can simulate all kinds of troubleshooting and so on as well for, of course, we do not have got an offshore nacelle, but I mean, a kind of troubleshooting. The turbines are quite similar, just bigger. Huh? So, and, yeah. and that's the way we are doing it. For sure now under COVID-19, tricky to send over now, for instance, the question in the morning we had got, can I, I'm allowed to send over UK guys to the training facility, how long they have to stay in guarantee, and yeah. so on and so forth. But uh, that's the normal way we are dealing with it, because we've seen that special trainings and trainings is absolutely necessary. Uh, so if you ask international, so um, I do not want to say it in an incorrect way, in Germany, if you hire an electric guy, you know that he has got at least three years of well education in electronic. Yeah, so and he has yeah. a certificate and so on. So if he opens a, a cabinet in a wind turbine or some or in a some some something something else, he knows exactly. Okay, that's a fuse that I have to do. I have to check it. You do not have to train him. So if I get stuff from uh, UK or as well from France. So the, uh, they work in a complete different sector, sometimes completely different jobs. So you have to to write then working instructions. Yeah. So as you're in the UK, you are mainly working with clear working instructions, very detailed instructions. And, uh, uh, and here as well, we have to learn it that we enable them in this way because from our German experience, you 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 know that the guys can work usually. Okay, you, you said okay, please uh, um, uh, uh, deal with the failure in the in the electronic systems. Then he knows roughly how to deal with it. Yeah, the guys sure. from UK or something from another area, you have really to train. And these training facilities, as I mentioned, we build up in north of Germany, and uh, yeah, that's our way. To, to bring it, but it's not something which is uh, which you can let's say generalize or something because the people are all are different and have different experiences. For sure, but and actually, I've heard I've heard some really interesting things about the training facilities uh, there. So I, I would love to visit one day, uh, but maybe maybe one day in normal or normal -er times. Yeah, no, always <laughs> with two Corona fresh two Corona tests, you can you can come over. That's that's not a problem. <laughs> okay, good to know. Good to know. Thanks for that. But one thing I, I want to add because you I'm mentioned so that that's positive. It's well a positive. We I try as well every time to find something positive in this in these uh -huh. times. Positive is. That really, as you mentioned now, uh, people from other industry are more interested to work in the service for wind turbines yes. because they recognize now, hey, your job is much safer than our job, for instance, in the automotive industry or something. So yes. that we're definitely recognizing that uh, requests here are, are increasing. Yeah. Yeah. No. For, yeah. Definitely for sure. And I think that is, you know, particularly as we have. You know, younger workers coming out of university or training colleges, apprenticeships, etc. That you, know, it, I think I, I'm certainly hearing that a lot. So it's great um, to, that you're hearing that too, as well. So I, and I fully agree with that. Um, I mean, sort of tied in with that in, in a way, when it comes to maximising availability of supply, it's of paramount importance to energy producers, but of course to energy off-takers, energy buyers, and and wider users. What do you think are some of the key areas to focus on to ensure that green energy continues to flow, both now but in general? In in general, so in general, I would say it's a, it's a, uh, it's the acceptances of the of the whole population in a country. So uh, because uh, uh, it's it's uh, what what Frederick in in your call mentioned especially. Yeah? So. Uh, if you want to 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 plan a wind wind farm in an area and you need a, you need now especially in France you are planning now with two megawatt turbines which is all very old fashioned now you're starting with three megawatts 
and yeah. the, uh, the population in the area is saying, oh no, it's far too big and wind turbines are anyway ugly, we do not need them. And, uh, and if we are not coming back, because that's unfortunately now the negative things in, in, this, in this, these times, the Friday for Future initiative is completely in the background. So the people are not talking anymore about uh, we cannot proceed like we are proceeding right now. So uh, there's, they are not in the, in the newspaper, in the news anymore. So the people are not thinking about, I have to change here something. We have to change. And I have to accept the wind farm over there because I want to have got a green future or a better future. And, yeah, uh, sure. and if we do not have got this push from the whole population, then as well, the, uh, uh, the, the, the military will not change the radar things, the, 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 the building permit guys will not uh, 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 accept the building permit because we need the pressure from the bottom. And that's currently what's unfortunately, I would say, due to Corona is missing right now, the strong voice. Yeah, I, I, th I think those are some some really interesting points, and and I'm hearing that from others as well. So there's definitely sort of improvements that that we need to make. But at the same time, you know, it's great that even in these uncertain times, you know, solar renewable and wider, sorry, solar wind and wider renewable uh, energy continues to flow, and we just seem to have found a way of of making it happen. But I think sort of tied in with that, and sort of how you work with these different partners, um, I've just sort of got two more questions for you uh, in quick succession. Um, predictive maintenance maybe offers a solution to some of that, you know, where you can essentially plan ahead and work mm. with local authorities in the local community. Uh, but it also offers efficiency and cash flow savings, wind farm owners, operators, which then should hopefully flow through ultimately mm. to uh, energy offtakers. How much of an impact do you really see areas around, you know, digitalization, uh, unlocking predictive maintenance for the industry going forward? Or are there other avenues for unlocking that as well? Mm. Uh, so my, uh, let's say my, my opinion and uh, and our, but my personal opinion is uh, that there are two different. Uh, you can you can uh, separate it in two different things. So offshore mm. and onshore. In the onshore business, from my experience, is uh, yeah, the, the, for instance, at customers, the technical departments are every time asking about big data, predictive maintenance, what kind of systems, and I want to have got all parameters you have got in your remote control. I want to have got all, all these data. Then you're coming to a case, and just for an example, that's for onshore, yeah? Then you're yeah. coming to a case that our guys are saying, okay, I have got now the old test, and the old test is saying, oh, there's something with the gearbox, so better to exchange it now in summertime instead of have got the failure in the in the in the winter time, huh? and then the technical people, oh yeah, great, and I've got the information and so on. But what do you guess, Phil? How fast then the customers are in the financial department, so that the, the purchase department say, okay, I exchange now a gearbox for let's say for two megawatt turbine for two hundred thousand k, yeah, because your data and your experience, where we are, most of the predictive maintenance is for us, experience of our service technicians. So they are sure. saying now the gearbox is 10 years old. Usually it could fail. Oil test is saying as well, something not so nice. Let's mm. exchange it. Yeah, but it runs in a perfect way. And then if you if you say A to, uh, to big data and predictive maintenance, you have to say B as well then, Okay, let's exchange it. Even if I do not see now uh, that uh, from external the production that something has happened. So from my experience, I see even if you have got a CMS system in the turbine, even if you see that something will happen, then it takes every time too long from the customer perspective to do something. So it must be as well than it. Other way is for sure uh, for for uh, for the offshore business. Here we need. Uh, more the CMS systems and so on, because as well the the, the differences we do not have, or the 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 the, the, um, uh, the whole industry do not have got that long experience with the turbines. So with the V90 or uh, MM892 or whatever Nordex turbines, or as well as the three mega turbines, we have got a certain amount of them, certain experience. But with the offshore turbines, which are most of the time are, let's say, prototypes, and just for a few years installed, as well, we do not have got the experience. We cannot say, I know after eight years the transformer will fail. 
So that's why I need there more uh, intelligence in the turbine to get uh, the information of the failure and for sure then every time the logistic is a few mm. times more cost, uh, uh, cost intensive. That's why I need here further modules. But bring it to the end. So onshore, honestly, a little bit like what Frederick said, too many informations brings you not to a better result if you do not make the doing. So you do something yeah. and then offshore we need it. Yeah, for sure. And ultimately, what I'm hearing there is that, you know, whilst predictive maintenance solutions, CMS solutions have their place, you can't beat mm. the knowledge and experience of a well-qualified yeah. engineer. So, you know, again, keeping that personal aspect is is really important. Uh, and that's that's really great to hear. Now, look, thank you for the time. Um, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to you and I'm looking forward to speaking to you again. Um, and uh, I'll speak to you soon. Okay, and I will continue here fixing the... Yeah, the you go for it. Yeah. I, I, I know with all your experience, you'll get there. Speak soon. <laughs> okay, cheers, Bye. mate. Bye. Bye-bye. Great. So, some really interesting insights there from the team at Deutsche Winter and Econ, how they've seen the last few months and uh, how everything's coming together. I think you know, really interesting to see the challenges that is, that is often forgotten when it comes to service and maintenance. Um, of wind farms, particularly offshore, uh, and I think you know we can all be thankful um, how you know how many people across Europe and and wider field have been you know going out to wind farm sites to make sure that they continue to run, while sometimes of course having to stay away from family and friends for for quite a, quite a long period of time. But it, uh, I'm certainly thankful for them doing that. So that was the end of my calls for today. Great to speak to everybody. What I will now like to do is invite all my speakers back on camera. Um, we've got a little bit of time for uh, some Q&A that's come in. So I'd like to welcome back Frederick, Mohammed, and Hendrik. Thank you, everybody. You can put your phones away now. You can put your phones away, but thank you for taking my calls earlier on. Um, really, really appreciate that. And we've had some really good questions coming in. Um, so I know we've, I know we're, we're going to run a little bit over time, but I hope the audience will not be uh, too upset by that, and, and, and will stay with us. So some great topics that we've discussed, and thank you for the calls. I've got the first question that's come in, which is around to Frederick, but I think you know applicable to everyone here. As we, or as as Cluster Energy continues to expand across Europe, it'd be great to get some insights, Frederick, on how you see the increase of wind energy demand over the next three to five years in terms of what's deliverable versus what's being discussed. So perhaps Frederick, you'd like to start off with that. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's a, it's, it's a good question. Uh, look, there's plenty of room. There's plenty of more room for uh, wind turbines in, in, in Europe. Uh, uh, what people don't realize is that the most recent turbine technology is at great parity. Uh, you can really produce energy that is cheap. Uh, contrary to other sources, it's uh, uh, it's neutral from an, uh, and positive from a, uh, an environmental point of view. So I think across Europe, <clears throat> there's plenty more turbines we, we, we can put in uh, and it, it has to be positive. Um, I'm convinced that there's plenty of room for us uh, and for more turbines. Yeah, well, that's, that's great to hear. I suppose it's about working with what we have, but also trying to work with uh, local and national governments and, and also the EU level to uh, to try and make those changes that are necessary overall. So thanks for that. Um, Mohammed, I'm not sure uh, if you want to come in on this as well, but also bringing in the uh, the solar side, you know, how, how we see these great ambitions coming out of uh, the EU institutions. What's your view on, on the increasing role of renewables in the energy mix going forward and how deliverable they are? So for us, um, it, one, some of the key findings for us, uh, and as uh, you may recall from some of the earlier resource uh, calling events, uh, it was quite uh, alarming to know that uh, some of the, the purchases that, and that have been that have been carried out by large off takers, they do not have clear visibility of what product they've purchased and what is the, exactly the um, 
the, the supply dynamic thereof. So say for instance, it was alarming to hear that a large off taker did not clearly ad, uh, understand the duck curve in California. And if uh -huh. they don't understand the duck curve, then what, what are you purchasing and how does that correlate with your existing uh, mix of products? So uh, what we've done is um, we've been able to forecast and do a algorithmic profile matching to be able to understand that what is the best geolocated supply of any given type based on historical data. So if a turbine and, and a solar PV plant has existed, then what's their reference use cases that we can take and predict that, that the future outlook is the same. So the point isn't necessarily to be able to say that, uh, oh, here's the best mix for you in terms of a named supplier, but it's more to say that the profile of the historical past has looked like this, so the future may well look like that if this is your given product mix between solar PV and wind and any other forms of uh, energy. And that's where the um, uh, flexi smart flexibility solutions of storage and uh, uh, balancing services is going to be very much key for us of uh, being not only to necessarily bolster supply of products like wind and solar PV, but uh, between both sides of, of demand side and supply side. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for uh, for, for that site, and, and I think there's some really interesting insights there we can delve in. Uh, the link and also links to some other questions. Um, Hendrik, I just wanted to bring you in as well. So we've talked there about how we make it happen, but of course the service and maintenance side is extremely important as the industry really you know takes off now and continues to grow. Right now we've got around 300,000 people working in, in the European wind industry. Mm. From a person perspective, what can governments do? To support our industry right now, no, and, to, and, to uh, make, and to make this growth possible when it comes to having enough trained technicians and and electricians, etc. So, so what the government can do is, uh, so uh, as I mentioned, so the main resource we are using or we are uh, we are uh, linked to is uh, is uh, other technicians. Eh? So this is really the, the bottleneck we have got. So. Uh, and to find the right technicians is from country to country different complex. Uh, uh, Frederick in, in France is, uh, is very compli complicated to find the, the right technicians. So, so here we would, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's difficult what the, what the government could do. So it would then start with education and so on and, uh, and uh, special training. So that you have got as well training schools and in different countries there are special schools or let's say training facilities where as well a job changer or career changer are then trained to change a job but even if i if we take over guys from these schools we have to train them a quite long time so it takes usually one to two years until one of these guys can run alone and uh, maintain with a partner then the, the turbine so tricky to say what the, uh, what the governments can do to support us here and uh, uh, that we have got enough service stuff. I would say what we have to do in the industry is to present our industry most attractive so that really the young guys coming from school are saying, okay, I do not want to work anymore in the automotive. Yeah, because automotive is so fancy and cars, I love cars. So we have to, uh, to, to, to represent ourselves uh, that uh, they are fascinated in, in new energy and fascinated in the industry. I guess that's more the way uh, we could uh, get more people here. Yeah, yeah the, the, that's great to hear. And, and as, as we talked about on our call, you know, we, we see more people making that change already, but there's also the need for more people to make that change. And, and exactly yeah. how we position our industry is going to be so important to make sure we frankly have enough people uh, to make it all happen. Um, but I know that uh, we're heading in the right direction, so that's great. So another question that's come in actually is, is around a topic that we talked about, Mohammed, which is on digital twins. So, you know, how you can sort of utilize a digital twin in the security or supply of energy and also linked to predictive maintenance. I'm interested to get, you know, uh, maybe an, a, you know, a 30 second or so answer on how digital, digital twins can really be used. 
So digital twins, uh, as um, uh, while discussing some of the elements that uh, Frederick had uh, raised around permitting and early stages of planning, uh, it's instrumental there because that's part and parcel of urban planning or industrial planning. So uh, in terms of being able to take a blank canvas uh, environment to showcase the uh, possible built environment scenarios and then to do simulations, that's uh, what we have discussed already. But beyond that, and actually discussing some of Hendrik's questions around training, digital twins are great in terms of being able to use tools such as augmented reality and virtual reality. So that not only helps with training and to be able to take uh, somebody who might even be trained in existing equipment, but needs familiarity with new equipment, even before it's being shipped or deployed or installed, then you are able to take your existing staff and get them trained uh, by using these tools. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it has a proven efficacy in terms of being able to change your uh, behavior and get better, deeper understanding, uh, especially with augmented and virtual reality. Uh, but what it hopefully also allows you to do is when you're in a control room, is to be able to zero in from a very macro perspective to down to a very, very specific micro uh, element. So where you should be able to go see literally as if you're stepping inside the machinery, whether that's a battery storage uh, container or it's a uh, large inverter. So you're able to actually pinpoint as if you've got a uh, uh, direct line of sight and a direct look and feel and touch. So it's uh, digital twins are basically a foundation that allows you to then start implementing these use cases of uh, different aspects and features of technology that are going to be uh, very helpful there. So long as uh, it's being managed top down and it's geared towards specific goals, whether that's operations maintenance or whether it's around training, uh, there's tangible value that it can bring. Yeah, thanks for having. I think I think that's a it's a it's a growing area that people need to be looking more at. Some are and, and some are taking an interest, but it's really interesting to hear how that can play such an important part in the in the overall process. Uh, two final questions to everybody. I'm conscious of time, and thank you for so many for staying with us. So this first question will be to I think Hendrik and, and Frederick on this one. As we look ahead, the likely situation is, is that more or less none of the existing onshore wind. Uh, and very little of the existing offshore wind capacity, and of course, most if not all of the solar capacity will still be there by 2050, bearing in mind the European Commission's goals. What opportunities and challenges do you both see as, in, as we increasingly turn our heads towards the conversation on repowering? So this is really important, particularly for the energy buyers who are, who are watching today, when they're considering their long-term 15, 20-year plus PPAs. Um, so perhaps Hendrik, you might, you might want to start on this one first. So, so what what chances I see in repowering and 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 uh, yeah. okay, so so uh, yeah, definitely. So uh, if you see, especially in countries like Germany and France and and as well as Spain, which are let's say the first countries for renewables, uh, is, so it's a huge task for these countries to find now. Uh, uh, a way to handle these these older turbines. So in uh, 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 we we have got as well a small department in Deutsche Wind Technik who is taking care of repowering and consulting as well uh, people. But it's a, it's a main question, especially in Germany. We have got uh, a few gigawatts which uh, usually will uh, build uh, build down or, or will go away in the next two years. Uh, uh, due to due to the age of the turbine, eh? and now we are finding just, and that's a pity. And there, the government should find an idea. We are just extending these turbines. Yeah, we are extending the uh, 600 megawatt uh, uh, kilowatt turbines and the one megawatt turbine. That makes no sense. We have to find a good way and a, and a good from the government, uh, uh, as well a good feed-in tariff or whatever, a good and simple idea how to repower it, because it makes no sense and it brings as well no acceptance if the old wind farm runs and runs and the rotor is running, spinning so fast and so on, and you could install two nice, smoothly running big turbines there, and, and here it's missing. It's missing in Germany, and I guess, Frederick, uh, it's, it's missing as well uh, from the government in France. Or? 
there's a shortcut process. You can actually, you're allowed in France to uh, <clears throat> renew your permit with a, a very short procedure if you don't change the parameters by more, more, more than 20%. In many cases, 20% is not enough. Look, I think I, I'm going to be a little provocative here, but there's a cost issue. Uh, we have to accept uh, that investment in our technology, in our industry is not finished. We, we've done the early days, there's a lot more investment to do. Uh, and we need to ask ourselves, where is the money most efficiently spent? And I think repowering is a great plus, especially when you're considering all the turbines, Technology today offers a lot more in terms of efficiency, uh, uh, OEM capacity, and and uh, and, and electricity uh, generation. Uh, the other thing is, as we do this, we also need to make sure we continue to build and keep here and make stronger the European manufacturing capacity. It's horrible that. Uh, the tender system is putting so much pressure on price in a region in the world where we pay people more, we offer more protection, people want to earn mm -hmm. more and more money, and we we are being driven by a tender process that pushes to Asia most of our manufacturing. I think we need to stop that. We need to make sure that we are also independent in the way we manufacture and do things. There is another cost by doing it here. We need to handle this uh, uh, rather than fight this. And it's it's a virtu it's a very positive circle. You you have more manufacturing capacity, therefore your you, you, your costs and to uh, to uh, to reduce. You are more attractive to people. You get more visibility. Uh, this is really a, a game changer to be pushed. We 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 need to bring back the industry in Europe. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really nice point for us uh, to to focus on and really sort of think about as we go forward because. You know, we need to find these solutions and uh, you know we need everyone working together to find the solutions rather than trying to find more problems so thank you for that uh Hendrik and Frederick so I'd just like to as a final question now uh, perhaps in one or two sentences here from all three of you um on this question if you could choose one game changer to get us to a 100 percent renewable energy future and for it to happen tomorrow what would it be so big question, one or two sentences. And Frederick, perhaps I could start with you. Well, I've touched on uh, what I think are the solutions. Uh, deploy the public subsidies so that we are more efficient and we can afford to have a production in Europe and facilitate permitting uh, so that it's no longer uh, an obstacle. It's something that helps uh, putting more turbines with a global assent of all the people uh, interested in it and including the stakeholders. Wonderful. And over to you, Mohammed. Um, I think uh, it's perhaps somewhat biased response from our point of view, but um, it's there's a lot of discussion around digitalization. There's a, a, a lot of discussion around the need for common standards. Um, I think for mass adoption, you need to simplify what's complicated today and to actually in, enable stakeholder collaboration. So even for whether you're from uh, uh, one market or another, if you have presence in terms of generation, you should be able to easily plug and play in terms of being able to do integration. And that doesn't exist today. Um, we would be great champions of that. Uh, there's existing uh, examples that exist today uh, for other industries like telecommunications, where entities such as uh, telemanagement Telecommunication Management Forum. They've created enhanced operating models that are common across industry, where industry collab collaborates a bit better. And they've done so because they had to do so uh, to enable better uh, transactions amongst themselves. So to do so would be great. And there's a great opportunity for the likes of uh, Wind Europe, Solar Europe to champion those causes. Fantastic. Yeah, some really, really interesting points there. Thank you for that. And Hendrik, over to you. 100% renewable future, and you could turn it on tomorrow. What would it be? Yeah, so uh, I would say the most important game changer, changer as I mentioned uh, in my call, is uh, the acceptance of the, of the population. So the acceptance and the willingness uh, to be green and to accept uh, solar fields, accept the new building permit around the corner in the neighbor village, 
if the population do not accept this, then as well the government can spend that much money, then you will not get the building permits you need for your wind farm. So the acceptance is really the main key, I would say, for the 100% for the uh, renewable energy. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. And that brings us to a close. I'd just like to thank Frederick, Mohammed, and Hendrik for all your fantastic insights and for being with us today, to the resource team for helping make this webinar happen, but of course to all the watchers and participants uh, for submitting some great questions and for watching today. Thank you so much. So I'd just like to finish with two final thoughts. Our next webinar is taking place next week and we'll focus on the guarantees of origin in the, in the context of implementing the Renewable Energy Directive. You'll discuss the bio and supply perspectives of the issue and how these differ and how we essentially make it work for us as the industry. The second element is I would like to invite all of you to take part in the Resource 2020 event that's taking place from the 7th to the 11th of December. The best-selling resource annual event is being transformed this year into a week of knowledge and experience sharing, inspiring keynotes and B2B networking and matchmaking. All of this will be available online so that everyone interested in PPAs and renewable energy procurement will be able to learn and do business. Whether you are an experienced energy buyer or supplier or you're new to the topic, the event is right for you to connect with people and content. So get inspired, understand the opportunities and learn the experiences of others to succeed in your business gaining green electricity. So head over to the resource website for more details to book your ticket now. So on that note, and thank you for everyone's time today, whether you've been watching or taking part in our calls, thank you very much and have a great rest of the week. Bye, thank everybody. You. Thanks, bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. bye.